um, would like to let you know um, that we're going to start off with the panel session. We're going to start off with opening remarks, actually, um, from Agnes, who you can be able to see on the screen. She's our Director of Talent Partnerships at Andela. She'll be able to speak to, more to that. And then after that, we are going to go into the panel session, where we are going to have um, questions directed to our panelists, who, again, you can see on the screen. Um, and they'll introduce themselves shortly. Um, and then thereafter, <laughs> thereafter, we are going to have questions. Um, so for the last 30 minutes of the call at um, half past, that's when we hope to start the Q&A session. Um, and at that time, that's when you'll be able to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. So please keep the questions coming, even from the beginning as we continue with the webinar, keep the questions coming, but we'll get to address them um, at the end. Um, so right now, before we go into the opening remarks, um, we have a number of people on the call as our panelists for the day. We have Nora, we have Angela, we have Afua, we have Amrote, um, and Bogwa who's joining shortly. Um, so we'll start with the order as is on my screen. So you'll start with Nora, and then Angela, and then Afua, and then Amrote. If you could be able to introduce yourselves, um, your name, your company, what you do, um, just a short introduction of yourself. And then we'll go to, yeah, and then we'll go to the others. Hi everyone, my name is Nora. I am a program manager on the people team at Andela. So I work with the people team to organize initiatives to support staff and engineers. Thank you, Nora. Angela? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Angela Hudro-Lungati. I'm the executive director of Ushahidi based here in Nairobi. Um, we focus on um, providing equal access to information, technology, and skills so that people are able to efficiently solve problems in their communities. Happy to be here. Afu, I think you should be next. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm at the airport. <laughs> Perfect timing. Hey, everyone. My name is Afo Ose. Because of the coronavirus, I've actually had to quickly run out of Johannesburg. So I'm at the airport, but I'm still excited to be here with everyone. I'm a co-founder of She Leads Africa, which is a digital media platform that helps young African women achieve their professional dreams. So I'm excited to be here with you all today. And hopefully the announcements will not keep coming on as I'm talking with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we can see your plans have had to change because of what is going on. But thank you for joining us nonetheless um, and looking forward. I think next we're going to have Amrata. You could introduce yourself, then Bogwa, and then Masi. Hi, uh, afternoon everyone. Uh, Ms. Abdella, Regional Director for Microsoft for Africa. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Mr. Mbogwa. Um, hi guys, my name is Mbogwa Njehia, the um, Head of Business and Partnerships at Shaw Corporation. We're trying to figure out um, how to make African cities move better and happy to be here. All right, thank you all for the introductions and joining us today as our panelists for the day. Um, then we'll have Masi, who's also joining me today, a colleague of mine, um, if you could introduce your, yourself. Thanks, Charity. Thanks, Charity. And to all the panelists, thanks for joining. Uh, amidst the pandemic that's happening, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hopefully, like, this will be, you know, a good hour away from all the news that is going on right now. So, uh, to everyone, my name is Masi, Masi Orangi. I lead developer relations activities for Andela in Africa. And, you know, part of what we do is try and connect um, tech thought leaders and experts as Charity is doing on this call, the external tech ecosystem. So, hopefully, this will be, you know, an insightful webinar for everyone who's joined. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, I think we'll now go to the opening remarks from Agnes, who, will, uh, in, as she introduces herself, will just jump right in into the opening remarks and just let us know for our topic for today, what exactly are we talking about? What can we um, look forward to? Awesome, thank you, Charity. Hi, everyone. My name is Agnes Mogoni, and I am the Director of Talent Partnerships 
Atandela, based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm delighted to be here, delighted to lean in and learn from our awesome panelists who are here to discuss individual responsibility towards inclusion in tech. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing themselves. What an earnest and apt quote from Leo Tolstoy, particularly in these times of profound uncertainty when we are going through a pandemic. Uncertainty in some cases makes people retreat back into their shell, afraid that the, their emotional, that there will be an emotional exposure that can lead to undesired discomfort. So I was reflecting on this statement and asking myself, what is it that I need to change of myself to make this world a better place? What do I need to do to create an enabling environment where each of my team members, both male and female, can culti cultivate and bring the best version of themselves to work? From a young female team member who just joined my team in Lagos and needs a space where she can surmount her feelings of imposter syndrome and build up her confidence to the more mature person who is thinking about retirement, to that engineer in Kampala who has a hearing impediment and wants to be seen and heard, just like everyone else. The truth is, if I want to create an enabling environment across multiple countries where everyone in my team gets to be seen and heard, then it starts with me. It starts with how I show up. It starts with having candid conversations about what I am great at, about what I'm not so great at. And it starts with delivering feedback with radical candor and kindness. Creating a space in our remote work environment where we get to celebrate our achievements and amplify our humanness could be as simple as sharing photos of a traditional wedding of one of my team members who just recently got married um, in Kisumu or sharing openly some of the challenges we experience on a day-to-day -day basis of being a caregiver for our aging parents. I really like this quote by Brene Brown that says, only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. And so I'll end off by saying, I really want to thank all the panelists for creating time and availing themselves to share their experiences here. Thank you, Amrote. Thank you, Judy, Angela, Afua, who is in transit, getting ready to board her flight in, in SA. Nora, thank you. We really appreciate you dialing in at a really obscene early time. Um, and Bogwa, being the only male panelist, we really want to appreciate your presence and fresh perspective that you will bring into this conversation. Lastly, I really want to appreciate the marketing and comms team, Charity, Mercy, and everyone else who's done a superb job in organizing this event. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Charity to take us through the next part of the event. Thank you so much, Agnes. Lovely, lovely um, opening remarks. I'm here wondering whether Zoom has a clap feature um, so that we can be able to applaud that. Thank you so much. Um, we'll right now just jump into our panel session where we'll get to just ask our panelists a couple of questions on the topic of individual responsibility towards inclusion in technology. Um, and I think just to start it off, just to each panelist, um, in one statement, why would you say inclusion is important? There's so much conversation going on about inclusion and diversity and companies are doing so much to ensure that they have inclusive perspectives in their companies, um, in their strategic plans. Why would you say inclusion is important for you? Um, and I think we'd go with Nora, Angela, Afua, Mbogwa, Amrote, in that, in that order. Thank you to everyone. Um, so I think personally to me, it is very important that people feel safe and valued in the work that they do and in their experience of work. But I also think by creating a workplace where all employees can express their ideas and be heard and where all employees have clear paths to grow at your company, 
you are also creating better output. I think that's true for any team, any company, any organization, that when a wider set of perspectives are taken into account, always smarter, more innovative, and better informed solutions are built. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Angela? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, building up on what Nora said. I believe that strength lies in differences, not, not in similarities. So, you know, it's about ensuring that we are fostering an environment where people of different genders, different geographic locations, different ideologies, thoughts, um, sexual orientation, skill sets, religions, ethnicities, that you're really providing a space for them to coexist and providing everyone with equal opportunity to thrive. And so even while we're talking about, you know, diversity and inclusion, you know, it's this, this, um, this quote by Vanna Myers always comes to mind that diversity is about being invited to the party, but inclusion is about being asked to the dance. So it's, it goes beyond you just having someone come to the party, but, you know, do they actually participate? You know, are you creating those opportunities for them to actually um, do stuff? So, yeah. So I really love that, that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being invited to dance, that you actually feel a part and parcel of the party, that you're participating and you're actually doing something there. That's, that's powerful. Thank you so much. Um, Fua, what, why is inclusion important to you? I think personally, we've all seen how we feel when we believe that we're being valued, when our opinions matter, we're more likely to be supportive, we're more likely to chip in, we're more likely to care about others. And when we think about the way that our communities and societies are changing, we need more people to care about what happens to others. We need more people to feel invested in the success of others but you're unlikely to feel invested, you're unlikely to wanna to be engaged if you don't feel as if you matter. And so if we want to build strong communities, if we wanna build strong companies, then it's important that everyone in the space feels as if they matter and that their opinions are valued. And that goes from everyone along the value chain. Customers need to feel as if you're creating products for me, then I wanna know that you're thinking about me, that people like me are reflected in your business makeup inside the company, knowing that my opinions are heard and I'm adding value and as a leadership, knowing that what you're doing is making an impact. And so from a resilience and a strength perspective, it makes much more sense to have people who are engaged and who feel valued. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and then we have Amrote. Why is inclusion important to you? We are on the one. <laughs> you, you can go first. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Look, I think um, so. There's uh, there's uh, the concept definitely around inclusion is becoming big, but I think um, it has to go beyond a quota system uh, that would really leave some not feeling like they're part of a team of a, of uh, a transformation. And so it's, it's, I think, tied to everything that everyone else has said, which is that how do you bring in different perspectives? How do you bring in sort of the diversity, not in terms of gender and race, uh, but also of age, of viewpoints, right? And so it's, uh, it, 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 it allows for everyone, uh, even on uh, the broader team, to have empathy, but also an understanding of what is different. And so uh, for, for me personally, as I think about inclusion, it's, the, it's an, an opportunity to reflect on, you know, what would I do? And, and, and how do I refrain from thinking in a particular way and allowing myself to consider the alternative, right? And so, because you know, the more, you know, a certain side of experience is very taken down into a certain viewpoint. And so diversity, even for me, and I'm saying this as, a, as, a, as an African woman, it's, it's to know, you know, what is the other, right? And, and how do I make sure that I don't create the other in the way we're setting up sort of our, my own team, how our own engagement, our customers and our partners as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amrata. Mbogwa. Uh, great. Um, again, it's great to be here. I think inclusion for me is more about balance and Having had the experience of going from small teams to also working with larger teams, you get to feel the sort of tension that occurs when there isn't inclusion. 
because you find instances where, say, you think you're working towards a common goal, but because people feel that they're not included in the process of um, ideation, creation, taking things to market, things end up falling, fall, falling apart. So inclusion is more about balance, making sure that you can actually, that there's actually empathy, um, whether it's for your consumer or from between your, yourself and your colleagues, just to make sure that everyone is, is aligned to the same sort of um, agenda without there being any, any water cooler conversation, so to speak. Because where there's no inclusion, what ends up happening is that small factions form. And with time, especially as teams grow bigger, uh, th those factions create cracks in the organization and you know, lead to the decimation of, say, relationships and overall um, company culture. So balance is, uh, is key for me when thinking about inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really like that. Um, thank you for all of your comments in just helping us to understand why is inclusion important. We've heard about empathy, that it's important to ask yourself, what is the other person going through and how can we be able to like make the, that experience better for them? Just being intentional about ensuring that we are not only looking for the quota for diversity, but we are intentionally and actively ensuring that people feel included and they feel part of the dance. I really love that analogy. Thank you, Angela. Um, and I think I'll start with you, Angela. <laughs> to the first question, um, as the executive director of Ushahidi, I do imagine that you are responsible for that whole organization, that the back stops with you. Um, and as a manager at that level, how do you champion inclusivity at the workplace? Um, and in the same breath, what would you say um, is leadership or management's role in championing inclusivity? We probably have someone who's at a manager on the call or wants to be um, a manager and they are wondering, what can I do? What is my part? Um, but for starters, let's start with how do you champion inclusivity at the workplace, given your role? All right, I will do my best. Um, so I think it, it helps that at Ushahidi, um, commitment to diversity and inclusion is something that comes, you know, it stems directly from the mission, right? Because, you know, it's always been focused on making sure that people have equal access to whatever resources they need to efficiently solve problems in their communities. And so it's made sense for us to make sure that that not only applies in how we build our tools or the people that we engage with, but also within the team, right? And I think it applies, I look at it in, you know, in, in, in three different ways. One, in terms of, you know, how we, how we build the team itself, the composition of the team, um, the policies that we actually set up in place, um, you know, some of the practical things you'll do on a day-to-day -day basis um, just to create that conducive environment for people, right? So one of them is we are a team that is spread out across the globe. You know, we have people from across 10 different countries. You know, we'll have, as much as we have a physical space here in Kenya, you know, we'll have people in the States, in Uruguay, in Sweden, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other places. So, you know, having that you know, such a multicultural team, people who bring in such different perspectives, not only in terms of their skill, but where they live, um, does help us to, um, you know, build, build the tools in the right way, but also help most of us, even in how we engage with other people. You know, they'll understand what Kenyan culture is in terms of keeping up with time, or Kenyan culture when it comes to conflict resolution and how, how exactly we engage with each other. And so you, you're really building that healthy environment for people to, to, do, it in, to do it in a good way. Um, when you look at some of the, the policies we have in place, it's even in terms of our hiring practices. Um, we don't, whenever we're looking at hiring, one of the biggest things we try to do is ensure that there is a diverse, a diverse um, group of people in the pipeline. And so what that means is that we have to actively engage with groups. If you know, we're looking, we're saying that we want more women in the product teams. Have we reached out to other women in tech groups? Um, you know, have we reached out to women in tech groups, even in a geographical location? Have we talked to groups in Africa? Have we talked to people in South America? Just so that we're making sure that even as we're making that selection, it's from a representative uh, pool of individuals. Doing things like setting up a parental leave policy that applies to both men women and you know by you know binary people that you know you can take three months off fully paid um and allow you to you know to, to come back and, and do your work in a in a good way and providing those flexible hours as well because those are some of the things that people might not necessarily look look into right 
And then going down into a much granular level, even in terms of how we communicate within our teams. Yes, you have the product team, you have the finance team, but are we creating opportunities for those uh, you know, separate groups to interact with each other? Does the finance team understand what's going on in the tech team? Is, are we surfacing um, the work that's being done at, at the group level so that we're not creating silos even within, you know, within the team? Are we making sure that there are open channels for people to communicate, open Slack channels and, you know, things like that? So one of the things we've done at Ushahidi that, you know, I've been a huge champion of is open by default. You know, making sure that, you know, your meeting notes are fully open, that you are being as transparent as you possibly, as you possibly can, can be. I think um, that would probably be my advice for anybody who's even coming in into a, a leadership position, that you try and understand, you know, what are some of those diverse backgrounds that people are coming, coming from and looking at what role you play in uh, providing a conducive environment for that um, connection to be happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. So I'm hearing policies that we need to be um, intentional about the policies that we have from flexible work to parental leave. I'm hearing communication, um, open lines of communication so that people feel inclusive. And then also being intentional about the composition of our teams, like and going all the way into our pipeline and not just at the stage of hiring, but also looking into the pipeline and how do we get people into that pipeline. Thank you so much. So insightful. Um, and even as we yeah. speak about, oh, one more, I, I see. Add, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I want, I want to just kind of add on, like, it's almost an anecdote, so to speak. When, when I joined Ushahidi, there were only three of us, three women on the team. That was Juliana, Linda, and myself. And, you know, it got to a point where sometime in 2018, the team was half and half. Literally, you know, half, half men, half women. And now, while it's kind of on the opposite end, we're actually at a point where we have more women on the team than men. So it's kind of like a, you know, a reverse, a reverse, uh, a reverse problem. But it's just to speak to that we were really, really paid attention to making sure that we had a representative team. And one of the biggest gaps we had at that time was having uh, more women on our product and on our, on our development teams. And we were able to balance that out and even get to the point where it's, you know, now we're seeing more women in leadership in, in, within the team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for that, uh, for that insight and showing us what you've been able to do and even that it has borne results um, in that area. And even as we speak about some of the activities that we have undertaken um, to champion inclusivity, um, Amrote, you've, you, have had, you have quite an extensive um, experience at Microsoft, um, you've worked with the World Economic Forum in Geneva as a, and also as a financial analyst at the World Bank. Um, you've, been, you've seen a number of institutions, a number of companies, a number of initiatives. What are some of the highlights in terms of all the initiatives that you probably have ever participated in or undertaken? What are the, some of the highlight activities that you have led in an official capacity towards inclusion in tech? Uh, thank you. Look, I think there are a, a few things, right? I, I think especially now with uh, diversity and inclusion, and especially sort of the women participation uh, being at the core of it, uh, they, there've been different institutions who've tried different things. Uh, so uh, the World Economic Forum, for instance, in terms of Davos and the CEO's representation, uh, would uh, would make sure that there would be an allocation towards women participation at a senior level uh, to be able to sort of have uh, you know the five seats that any company would have right otherwise they would have to take less so there's some that have taken you know very strategic directions and making sure that you know even at the top level that there's intentional uh, pool of women to come and be part of some of these meetings right so because and and for me that was an eye opener as well because you think about sort of the women participation and sort of this this middle management layer of women that you want to bring in and then you realize that even as you go higher up that it doesn't get any easier right and so what are some of the leeways and systems that need to be put in place that that will actually enforce some of these decisions and i think the other one perhaps even now today uh, i'll share with you is uh, at microsoft right um, we are super committed to sort of making sure that we are hiring women and focusing significantly on sort of attracting, retaining uh, women uh, talent. Uh, but in doing so, to, you know, if I want to hire someone today on uh, an open position, uh, I actually have, and, and it's not a woman, 
uh, I actually have to provide the justification uh, of why it's not one, right? Uh, have I been open in terms of the candidates that have been uh, that have been considered? Did I have a strong pipeline of women that were actually even considered before the interviews, right? And then what is really exceptional about this person versus someone else that I could probably delay hiring for the next two, three months to make sure that it comes? So, so honestly, I think it's that the intention is always good, but I think, you know, there's always better, uh, outcome and impact when there is a system that forces uh, and, and force functions sort of the reconsideration because it's always easy to sort of say yes I understand you know and I have the commitment to women and diversity uh, but if those systems are not in place to check my own thinking and my own process sometimes it's very easy to to go astray so so there are definitely more and more intentional systematic approaches that really ensure that uh, it's not just you know a pipeline issue of candidates, uh, but that there's actually a business reasoning as well, right? And so, and so this, I think, will really help us elevate, but also attract uh, even stronger women uh, from diverse backgrounds, uh, and then retain those as well and, and push them higher up. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for sharing your perspectives on that. Um, and I like what you've mentioned that even as we champion different initiatives towards inclusivity, inclusivity that there are better outcomes when we have systems in place that check on that. Um, and just to continue on that point, um, Nora, um, being in the people team here at Andala, but um, we call it the people team, elsewhere they may call it the HR team. Um, let's talk about systemic barriers. For most companies, we, you see most companies moving towards automated processes for in interviews and even other processes within the company. And some of these things might perpetuate um, the lack of diversity. So how can companies know or identify what are some of their processes that are barriers to inclusion? Yeah, so I think just hearkening back to what Angela mentioned about maybe being invited to the party but not being invited to the dance, I think before you even think about your recruitment processes, it's really important to look at your company's culture and what kind of implicit biases are embedded there. Um, because it doesn't matter who you're able to hire if you're not actually allowing those people to contribute to your company once they join. So I think a good way to identify those things is looking at your culture and really looking at what kind of behavior gets rewarded via your culture. So look at your performance management systems and how decisions are getting made. Um, look at the data for who's getting promoted, who's consistently getting highly rated in performance reviews, whose opinions are being heard and driving decisions. And you can see like what trends do you see in that data? Is this favoring some types of people over others? And that's how you can start to identify what kind of implicit biases are showing up and that is pervasive throughout your company. So once you understand how that looks at your company, you can start to define the culture that you actually want to have in a way that provides opportunity for a variety of perspectives, experiences, communication styles, et cetera, to actually be affirmed and rewarded. So by clearly defining this criteria for success at your company and abiding by those criteria via your performance management structures, you can offer a more equitable opportunity for all of your employees to grow at your company because people know explicitly what is required of them in a way that's not kind of mired in unnamed biases. Um, I think for leadership, it's also important to make inclusive behavior a core competency and something that can be evaluated via 360 feedback and like make that an important part of leadership's performance reviews and tied to incentives if you can. When you're going through kind of decision-making processes, talent processes, goal setting, performance reviews, et cetera. You can also try to embed some DNI training into those materials so that people are consistently thinking about how they can be more inclusive as they're going through those processes and identifying any hidden biases that are impacting thinking as those decisions are being made. Um, I think particularly for leadership, it's important for them to go through unconscious bias training as they're going through performance reviews so that they can identify if and when they're consistently kind of advocating for people to be promoted that are just similar to them. And there's kind of like a like me bias happening there. Uh, turning back to recruitment, I think y'all said some really great things about making sure you have a diverse pool of candidates. I think it's important that 
not just one um, like kind of tick the box person represents a minority group, but you have multiple people. Statistics really show that if you have only one person representing a minority group, they have almost no chance of getting hired. But when you have multiple folks, that that really increases the chances. So making that a requirement, like y'all mentioned. I think also look at your hiring team. So having a diverse recruitment team instead of hiring managers ensures from the jump that you have a diversity of perspectives represented in that decision making process of who is joining your company. You can also help hiring managers who maybe don't have that mindset kind of check their biases after interviews with intentional debriefs. And then back to kind of making sure you have a wide slate of candidates that you're looking at. Um, building relationships with different affinity groups, networks, organizations, etc., to make sure that your pool of candidates is actually representative of the world is an important practice for your recruitment team. And lastly, like the, the last thing I'll say is remember that it's a long game. When you're changing mindsets and behaviors of people at your company, it's not going to happen overnight. So you just really have to have faith and patience with your DNI initiatives um, and kind of remind people that that's important. Thank you, thank you so much, Nora. Um, just a lot of wise um, information there. Um, and just to remind people, for those who are joining us, um, feel free to use the Q&A feature. You can see it at the bottom of your screen um, so that you can be able to drop in your questions even as the panel co discussion continues and Marcy will be helping us moderate the Q&A session when we get there. Um, so Nora, you spoke about implicit bias. Um, and implicit bias are just some of those attitudes that we may have that affect our beliefs, they affect our actions and our decisions in an unconscious manner. So we do, sometimes we may not know that we are acting in a certain way that is promoting um, exclusivity instead of in inclusivity. And just to ask this question now to Mbogwa, um, people are often unaware of the ways in which their beliefs and perceptions of others affect their behavior. And the result of that is that you find you are in a workplace or in a team that is exclusive. People don't realize that, oh, it's only these certain three people that always go uh, to lunch together or they go to the water cooler. You know, they're just those small, small things that form out of habit and you don't realize these are some of the things that are making someone else not feel included. And so what are some of the things that we can do, even as we talk about individual responsibility? What are some of the things that we do to promote an exclusive culture? So I think the first thing is awareness. What are those things that we do promoting an exclusive culture that we can now look out for and be conscious about and go like, oh, this might not be uh, so good for someone else. So yeah, so what are some of those things? What can you say? I mean, um, uh, great take on, on that particular issue. I think the first one, uh, that everyone would probably connect with is what I call the bro culture. And this has been started from, you know, the, the mecca of tech, which is uh, Silicon Valley. And those stories are horrid. And it's about, you know, most startups, at least for the past decade or so, were primarily um, had male teams. And the simple way in which they were started out of this garage and people could be, for example, living in boxers or drinking beer and making lewd jokes. Uh, some of that stuff gets perpetuated beyond that phase of the business or certain assumptions that are made, you know, it, I'm just joking. I mean, it's just, I mean, she, uh, Mercy should be able to take a joke. Yet that very culture and the way we interact within those teams makes people feel excluded. Someone says, I'm not going to join a startup simply because I, I'd much rather wait for you to get further along. Because I know if I come in now, I'll be, I'll be the single female dev or engineer or a project manager. And I just don't feel how you guys act, whether, whether I get that vibe from your social media posts or just generally having seen you within a, a, a specific space. So I don't feel comfortable being in the same room for all of my nine to five. And unfortunately, some guys say, if you, if you, can't, if you can't hack it, then you, then you ship out. So we can be very deliberate about how we then make sure that early teams actually form what will be the foundations of a, of a great team culture going forward, that some, some of these behaviors are not entertained uh, um, in the least. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll, we'll end up driving people out of our companies and, and never really achieving this inclusivity that, that we want. I actually have a story about this particular issue. 
Um, and it was when we were, we were initially starting out the, the company and I was, I was moving around asking, uh, we're looking for, uh, we're, we're looking for data scientists because we were primarily a, a, data, a data company. And, you know, I, I go to one of the local universities and one of the professors says, um, I've got an amazing student. You know, she's currently out in Uganda, but she's not doing her life's work. Like, you, know, you get out of campus, you're passionate about uh, this thing of, of, uh, of data science. But you know how it goes. You will get a job to just get by. And I reached out and said, hey, um, we're starting out. You know, it's a, it's a small team. Uh, we'd really appreciate you. You've, you've come highly recommended by your, by your for, former, former teacher. Um, how do you feel about joining our team? And she's like, okay, uh, you know, what's the size of the team? How's, how's it looking now? You know, what, what sort of runway is there? And we're very open about that process. And unfortunately, we got declined. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is weird because this is one of those tasks that would totally appeal to someone um, of her caliber. And as, as month went, went on, I actually reached out and said, why, why wouldn't you join yet? It felt like something that you're, is right, right along your, your area of work. She said, uh, I've, with, my, with my own classmates, the guys I studied with, if those are the caliber of people that I'd be coming to join in terms of if, if it's a startup environment, I do not want that. I'd rather stay where I am. I know it's not something I'm passionate about. It's going to pay the bills. But she literally said this, talk to me when your father alone. And you know, probably stuff has developed a lot more. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty insightful because it means that even from the get-go, we need to be deliberate about creating safe spaces, especially for um, team members that actually drive that inclusivity agenda. And not just to fill a quota, like Amrote said, but because we actually believe that it's gonna bring, uh, bring a difference. I think one of the things that we do wrong is management hierarchies. We have open plan offices, but we don't have open offices where people still feel that I can't really speak my mind. Um, and if I speak it, you know, they say the nail that sticks out is one that gets hammered. So people uh, agitate for stuff, but you, they almost unionize. Um, I want to use a Swahili term, chinyamaji. Like it's, 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 in the, it's in the shadows because people don't feel that they are able to uh, fully express themselves and say, listen, um, whether, it's, whether it concerns the product or whether it concerns the company itself, people don't feel that they're able to freely speak because then it's very easy for you to get uh, identified and isolated as a person. And you know, you'll, you'll get what's coming to you, whether it's gonna be a, a reprimand or suddenly when you know, in the season of, of a lot of HR reviews, you're told, you're, you're not really, you're, you're not really told what's wrong, but then the review comes back negative and you're not entirely sure what, what that's about. And people end up uh, bottling up. I think the final one is um, balancing personalities. You know, again, uh, companies that are a mix of people and there are some guys who can get really loud. So then the, the, I think the, the law of nature is that, you know, it's the loudest guy who gets heard. So if you're not deliberate about ensuring all voices are heard, they'll end up being out of a team of, uh, of 50. They'll end up being five guys whose agendas get to the table, as opposed to saying, you know what? Yes, Mbogwa, you, you, um, you, you have a loud voice. You, you agitate for your stuff, but keep quiet for a minute. Let's, um, let's hear from the rest of the room. Let's hear from other people so that we can get a balanced perspective as opposed to having a company that can actually be fully directed on the whims and, and are able to agitate a lot more for, uh, for what they want. So for me, those three, um, th that initial culture, uh, and primarily it's about the bro culture that is pervasive in startups and ends up trickling into um, corporate, corporate -ish, corporateness as the companies grow, the management hierarchies where we have um, open plan offices but no open offices per se, and conflict of personalities of being able to just better manage personalities that are present in, in any working organization. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really like that one about having open offices, but not really open offices, that you're open, your office has an open plan, but open as much plan. as open, yeah. yes, as opposed to foster um, transparency, people really are not open because they're not talking and they don't feel that yeah. they are safe yeah. um, to voice their opinion. So I think 
we really need to um, focus on creating a culture of safety where people can be able to voice their opinions. Um, and then finally, Afua, even as we go into the Q&A session, um, from the example Mbogwa has given, he's actually given quite an apt example, which is tied to my question to you about the interview stage, that someone comes into a company and even through the interview process, they are feeling, I'm not so sure about this place. And it might be something that's not aware to the people interviewing them or to the company, but as uh, the person on the other end, as a job seeker, you tend to see a few things here and there that don't sit well with you. So, um, Employees today are really looking for truly inclusive workplaces and not workplaces that are just um, ticking boxes to fulfill our quota. So what are some of the markers to look out for, for some of the job seekers who might have um, on the call? And for all of us at one point or another, we were a job seeker or we will be. So what are some of the things to look out for when you're looking for a truly inclusive workplace, a place where you will feel valued um, through the interview and hiring process? Great. Well, ownership is so important and it's really critical that as you are going through this process and you're being evaluated and people are determining if you're a right fit, that you also have the same mindset to determine if that company is the right fit for you. So some of the things to look out for, which are a bit unconventional or unusual is one, how long do people stay in the company, right? ask the question about what the average turnover rate is. Because a lot of people can get a job, but the real question about within a space is open and inclusive and people feel comfortable is typically how long are they willing to stay? Do they feel that this is a good space for them? Do they think that there's room for growth? And of course, we know that millennials and Gen Xers, we like to move and try new jobs. But if you see that there are a lot of people who are leaving within three to six months and companies aren't able to hold on to good talent, that should be a red flag that perhaps there's something in the culture that doesn't really work and make sense. Additionally, is you should look for where is there women leadership in other areas that are maybe non-traditional. So there can be traditional areas that we've seen typically, let's say in HR or people operations or in marketing and communications, but you wanna look for, are there senior women leaders in other spaces across the company? to let you know that it's not just about numbers, but it also is about impact all across the organization. You should also ask companies about their specific policies that are related to women and transitions in life. So maternity leaves, even paternity leave, healthcare packages, because even if a company is not there yet, you wanna see what's their mindset around it. Are they thinking about fairness? Are they thinking about equality? Are they thinking about opportunity for all? And if the person is saying, oh, well, no, that's not important to us, then it kind of gives you a clue and a signal as to how they'll respond if there are other issues. And then lastly, it's always ask for an opportunity to speak to current or former employees. Of course, whoever is in that interview is representing the company. They're going to do their best to present a particular viewpoint. So ask if they're willing to introduce you to other people who may give you a more realer and honest perspective. And if there are no women in the company that you can speak to or none of the women have a really positive um, perspective on how the company is thinking about inclusivity, and that also is a sign for people to be wary of. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Um, I think it's something that we most people usually tend to look out for. Um, and I think now we'll go into the Q&A session. We have quite a number of questions and Marcy will help us moderate that. Marcy? All right, thank you. Mic check. You can hear me? Okay, fantastic. So I see uh, on the clock we have 12 minutes. So I will do my best to go through the eight questions we have so far, I'll distribute them amongst the panelists, so get ready. Um, and I'll just read in verbatim. And thank you to everyone who's asked a question so far. So I'll kick off with Sandra's question. Sandra asks, um, as women, how do we find the perfect balance uh, between career work and family? So Angela, I don't know if you want to take that. And then as you prepare, probably I'll read the second question. Um, so Wanja from Microsoft asks, how
Hello? Marcy, I think we lost you. Um, yes, we did. I think I'll read one just question even as she comes back online. Um, how can we ensure collaborative efforts among like-minded stakeholders and combine efforts to enhance tech inclusion? So how can um, different stakeholders come together? I think I'll direct that to Amrote. Um, so we'll answer those two first and then, yeah, and then also asking our panelists to keep our answers nice, short and brief so we can get through as many questions as possible. Okay, um, I'm Hmm. How to find a perfect balance between career, work, and family? I think, in in the spirit of also being inclusive, it's it's worth also keeping in mind that while in the African continent it's predominantly a problem for for women given our cultural background, that in some other areas of the world you, know, you have some men also going through with the same issue. You know, looking getting back to the, the, bone, you know, the, the bare bones of the question, which is how do you find a perfect balance? I, I don't know that there is such a thing as a balance. I think there are attempts at it, um, but we are still yet, there's still a lot more that can be done to, you know, to, to scratch that itch. Um, there's a lot of companies that are trying to be progressive in terms of, of um, allowing people to be able to, to balance that out. You know, groups like Safaricom, I know Andela is also doing a really good job at that, where you provide spaces for people to, you know, for, for parents to bring in their, their kids so that you're able to focus on your work, knowing very full well that your, um, that your child is taken care of or others who might decide to help support in terms of uh, child care um, or providing flexible flexible work hours because it'll, it'll really depend from, It'll depend from context to context, um, but I think the onus is really on the the organizations creating that conducive environment for their for their employees. Because if you create a situation where an employee feels like they have to choose between the career, work, and family, it, it it's it's a very unfair choice. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of research that has been done around um, how some of these policies, these things that organizations do, actually do more. Um, or rather create an opportunity for more retention in, in, you know, more retention in the sector. So key that I think would be, it, there's still a lot more to be done. It's, it'll need to be a combination of, even for us, um, you know, uh, as individuals or employees, being very open about some of the challenges we're facing in terms of striking this balance, but organizations creating those policies and those conducive environments. Fantastic. Thanks, Angela. I hear I froze. I apologize. I'm back. I can see people nodding, so I, I'm sure I'm live online. So the second question, uh, you know, is from Wanja. Um, Bugwa or Afwa, if you can take it, because Wanja is from Microsoft. It's great to hear thoughts from, you know, uh, other countries, other people. So she asked, how can we ensure collaborative efforts amongst like-minded stakeholders, like the panelists in this session, and combine efforts to enhance tech inclusion. Afua, you want to go first? Sure, so we have to remember that everyone will have different intentions and they'll have different goals. And so it's not something that can be mandated or forced, and perhaps that isn't even the way it should be, because inclusivity is such a big issue across various sectors, we need people to be addressing it in many different ways. So for example, She Leads Africa, we're working, we're focusing on young professional women, whereas there are plenty of people who are thinking about getting women into senior leadership and on boards. And there are other people who are focused on STEM education for school children. Everybody is hopefully aligned to the same kind of goals and passion, but how they choose to execute it may be different based on their skills. I think what we can do is sharing best practices. That's definitely important. If, if a resource or a tool has been helpful for you, sharing it with others, helping people learn how to be more effective in the work that they're doing. I think also um, providing insights or access to funding and opportunities. So if someone approaches you with something that may not be a good fit, passing it along to someone else in the sector who might be better. And I also think that open dialogue and conversation is so helpful. Making sure that people are staying up to date so that they see new issues or new challenges that everyone can be aware of. But what I recommend is 
instead of waiting, because I, I see this a lot and I get this question quite often, instead of saying that, oh, government should do this or this big company should do this or these people should do this, my question is what can you do in your space to make a difference and to add value? It has nothing to do with what anybody else on this panel is doing. It has nothing to do with any of the big companies are doing. How can you use the skills and the resources that you have to make an impact in your space? And as that grows, then find opportunities to link up. But we shouldn't wait for others to start doing the work where we are. Thanks. Thanks, Afua. I like that. It actually speaks a lot to individual responsibility, which is part of our theme today. Um, so because of time, I'll just move to the second question. I'll direct this to um, Rote. So an anonymous attendee asks, if someone is looking at uh, switching careers into the tech industry, assuming you're starting from scratch, what would be the best way to start in terms of knowledge acquisition? Look, I think if you're, if you're looking at coming into tech, right, uh, one, understand exactly what, what area you want to work in, right? Uh, and I think the options there are, do you want to work for a startup which is on the smaller side, the medium size, or you want to join a multinational? And then just really be clear around the experience that you want to get. And, and, I, and I emphasize on that because it's not necessarily what you have, because then you can become very limited around what you can even explore as possibilities. And in some instances, you will find out that, you know, uh, you may not necessarily have a degree in software engineering, but you will have a valuable sort of skills that you can add, whether it's on the business side or on the business support side, uh, that will go a really long way. So I would, I would really say sort of uh, know, be clear on what you have in terms of skill set, but then be also even uh, more specific about sort of the aspects uh, in tech or in the particular organization that you've seen that you want to learn about and then go after that and, and take it. But uh, from, from what I have seen, um, the opportunities in terms of uh, career in tech is not limited fully to those who have studied it. Uh, and so everyone has a role to play in it and it's just a question of when you're learning appetite. Uh, your curiosity, and then more importantly, sort of how, how willing you are to collaborate, but also sort of immerse yourself in the experience uh, so that you can make the most out of it. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so another anonymous question, Buga, I'll let you uh, respond to this. So someone asks, I'm a recruiter from Uganda. My question is, how do you proactively source and encourage people from underrepresented groups to apply for roles that are predominantly thought to be for a specific group. For example, encouraging women to apply for, you know, roles that are thought to be predominantly for men. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, it boils down to intent. You have to be, as an organization and as a recruiter, you have to be intent about um, actually sourcing for these people. You know, it's, um, some guys are, are hidden in plain sight. Remember we talked about uh, guys as could be brilliant, but they don't have a voice in the sense, in the traditional way that they don't shout about it. But if you're well connected, you're deliberate about your recruitment effort and you plug into the right sort of ecosystems or circles, you'll be able to find uh, those gems and you should not be afraid to actually seek them out. And people are sitting in jobs that may not truly fulfill them and they're waiting for this opportunity. And sometimes it takes one to say, hey, uh, Mercy, I heard about you, or I've read about you, or I have found out about you from a third degree network, and I think you'd be a perfect fit for this. And this is this is what you're willing to do to actually uh, to actually bring you on board. So that thing about um, yes, there are all these platforms out there that use AI, ML, um, etc. to kind of like source and filter for you um, who they think would be right for your organization, but I don't think they're there yet in terms of that human feel that you'd be able to actually, once I connect with someone and speak to them, be able to feel that uh, they'd be a great addition to the, um, to the company in terms of culture, or just generally being able to drive that inclusivity agenda and, and bring that difference to the company. Fantastic, thank you Mbogwa for that. Uh, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, I'd like to direct this to Nora. Um, so Solomon Osadolo asks, I'd like to ask about how each of the panelists, so hey, Nora, because of time, are ensuring inclusivity uh, with regard to generational gap when it comes to employee hire and experience. 
Thank you. So I think this boils down to being able to identify and understand the different kinds of values that different types of people can provide. And so I think people that are potentially older than the millennial generation have so much value to provide in terms of just the amount of experience, the amount of different types of experiences they've had, and the amount of inflection points and journeys that they've seen different companies and organizations go through. I think that is so, so valuable. And when you're going through the recruitment process, it's important to identify what those different strengths can be and it's important to build a team in an organization that has a balance of different kinds of strengths and is able to contribute a diversity of value, not just in terms of identity, but in terms of thought. I think at Indela, one of the main reasons actually that I was attracted to join um, was because of the experience and age of leadership that I saw across the company. I was coming from a company that was almost exclusively millennials, and there are just so many gaps in knowledge in terms of leadership and being able to navigate difficult situations that having been through that before just really makes a company stronger. All right, thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Ah, Nora, who am I calling you, Nicole? Nora, thank you for the response. I see we are right uh, at the top of the hour. I do not want us to, you know, go beyond what we had promised. I see we still have five open questions. So for the ones that have not been answered live, we are going to share this with the panelists. And then um, as Andela, as we share a recap of what this webinar has been about on all our social media channels, we are also going to highlight the responses to this question. So I want to again appreciate everyone who's put in a question, amazing questions. Thank you to all the panelists for your insight and thoughts as you responded. Much appreciated. So Charity, maybe you can wind up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marcy, and thank you for everyone who submitted a question, our panelists for answering our question. To our panelists, thank you, thank you so much for availing your time to join. And even before this um, webinar, for all the, pre -prepar the preparation that went into this webinar, you still availed of your time. Thank you so much and looking forward to more collaboration um, and more remote work. It, it is exciting. So we can have an event online. This is how it's done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a great rest of the week. Bye.